Please note, in order to comply with YouTube policy, this free version of the audiobook has bedroom scenes and curse words redacted. If you would like to read the full text, please get the ebook version of the story. Chapter 1 Pregnant and alone. These are words that I never imagined would apply to me. Like everyone else I know, I had always dreamed of finding true love, getting married and then and only then, having a baby and living happily ever after. That is the natural order of progression. It is the way things are supposed to go. So, why in the world did I go and get myself into this predicament? What had I been thinking? I hadn't been thinking. That is the only explanation for my reckless behavior. I allowed myself to be swept away by romanticizing what turned out to be a dalliance, and in the process, I managed to ruin any chance I had of enjoying a normal and traditional life. The most I can hope for now is finding someone who will love not only me, but also my fatherless child. I have severely limited my options and possibly alienated my soulmate. After all, how many men are dreaming of finding their one true love, who also just happens to already be knocked up by another man? My guess is that the answer to that question is a big fat zero. I have been dreading telling my parents about my situation. They are both very conservative and traditional. They have always warned me about the dangers of falling for someone from the mainland. I'm afraid that my news will shock them immensely. Or worse yet, they'll use the ultimate parent guilt trip phrase, I'm disappointed in you. Those words tend to cut particularly deep for me. Being their only daughter, I have always tried to live up to their extremely high expectations. I've attempted to appear perfect to them, despite knowing that I am nowhere near that level. In school I became the straight-A student, the cheerleader, the homecoming queen, and the lead in all of our drama club plays. I did all of this in the hopes of making it up to my parents, for being a girl. My brother never had to work so hard, or at all, for their love. He was praised just for being alive and male. I however, consistently felt like they wished I had been their second son. Having heard my father speak of an heir and a spare, more times than I care to remember, I was well aware that I wasn't the spare he had dreamed of. So. I became the consummate overachiever in a desperate attempt to compensate for being born without dangly bits. Not going to college had been my first overt act of rebellion. Turning down my full, ride scholarship is something for which my parents will probably never forgive me. I hadn't felt ready to leave behind everything and everyone I had ever known, especially my two lifelong best friends, Kai and Honey, to go to the mainland. I was afraid to leave and risk losing an important part of myself in the process. Our island's culture and traditions are ingrained into my soul, but I was concerned that my distinct sense of self might become blurred if I were to leave. I didn't want to become part of the melting pot. My parents should have been proud of me for that. Unfortunately, all they focused on were the unredeemed possibilities. Whenever the opportunity arose, they liked to point out the fact that I was still just working at that little hotel. The disparaging words they used to describe the fabulously authentic resort where I worked made my blood boil. Even the fact that I have become a prophet, sharing owner in the successful seaside escape, didn't sway their opinions of my career choice. Rather than admitting that I am already building a sizable nest egg through a career that fulfills me, my parents choose to point out at frequent intervals that I am a glorified maid. In some respects, they are right. I do fill in for housekeeping. I also fill in for bartending, reception, grounds, and whatever else needs to be done at the time. All of the employees jump in and help out wherever we are needed. The direct result of the employees being shareholders in the resort is that we all love it as our own, because it is our own, and will do whatever it takes to make it a smashing success. After all, it's in our own best interest. Even Kai, whose family built the resort from the ground up, isn't afraid to plunge a toilet or launder the sheets and towels. Though he runs the resort, he quickly volunteers to work in the trenches when the need arises. In return he expects the same from the rest of our close-knit crew. We all gladly comply with anything he requests of us, because he respects us, 
and rewards us generously for our loyalty and hard work. Honestly, it doesn't even feel like work at the resort. We all have fun and love our jobs. It's like getting to hang out with the second family that you like better than your real family. Plus, the longer we stay employed there, the more ownership percentage shares we acquire, which leads to earning more money. Talk about a win-win situation. We have yet to have our first employee owner quit since Kai instituted the employee shareholder plan. It's that terrific of a place to work. My parents failed to see any of that, though. Speaking of my parents, my phone is jingling with the song Mother Knows Best from Rapunzel's movie Tangled. Mom hates the choice I made for my phone's ringtone for her, but the title perfectly describes how she feels. She seems to think that I should just do whatever she says, simply because she feels that she knows better than I do. She has always been heavy on the because I said so reasoning, in lieu of a valid explanation. Even though she is returning my call, I chicken out and don't answer. I fully intend to tell her and my father about the pregnancy, just not right this second. I have to do it soon though, because my body is starting to betray my secret. My belly is already protruding, like I just scarfed down a jumbo basket of Parmesan truffle fries. I smile to myself, realizing that I know exactly what that looks like from first-hand experience. The supply of brown paper bags tucked away in my purse is the other dead giveaway to my pregnancy. The near, constant nausea and frequent vomiting this pregnancy has blessed me with are becoming difficult to explain away. Fortunately, I've become extremely adept at quietly slipping away to a hidden corner and throwing up with minimal sound into one of my trusty bags. I guess that's fortunate, anyway. It's not exactly a skill that I had ever dreamed of mastering. Leilani, Queen of the Quiet Pukers. I can't understand why my parents aren't proud. Chuckling at my silly, wayward thoughts, I am once again distracted by a song playing from my phone. This time the lyrics to My Girl by The Temptations are blaring to indicate an incoming call from my father. It startles me so much that I nearly drop my phone. The song brings back instant, wonderful memories of the time when I was about 10 years old and Dad was in a rare, silly mood. He danced down our hallway one morning, holding my hand and serenading me with this tune. It is one of the most splendid memories of my childhood. I had made that his ringtone as a whimsical reminder of that day, but I had never heard it actually ringing since the day I selected it. My dad never calls. The fear that something is terribly wrong courses through me, setting off tiny explosions in my nerve endings and making my breath stop involuntarily. Makuakane? I choke out the traditional Hawaiian word for father, which I know that he prefers. I can't keep the panicked edge out of my voice as I answer his call. Just a moment. His gruff voice comes over the line, then I hear a shuffling as he hands the phone to my mother. You ignored my call but answer his. Mother's shrill and offended voice bellows over the line. I'm sorry. I thought something must be wrong for him to be calling me. Is everything okay? I ask her, still worried. No, everything is not okay. She informs me briskly. How could everything be okay in a world where a daughter ignores her mother's calls? I take a deep breath and sit down, realizing that this might take a while. I let her rant for a bit about how disrespectful I am. When she pauses to take a breath, I decide it's now or never. I have something to tell you both. My heart thrums rapidly in my chest as I wait for her to locate and push the speaker button so I can admit my sins to both of them at once. I can hear the pulsing beat in my head as she finally figures it out and I blurt, I'm pregnant. Dead silence greets me. It stretches on for so long that I begin to wonder if she truly did put it on speakerphone or if she accidentally hung up on me. I don't want to have to make this confession to them again. How could this be? My father finally croaks. I can tell that my news has stunned him. The question is silly and I'm not sure how to answer it. I'm quite certain the snarky response about the logistics of the birds and the bees is not the way to go. My mother saves me from having to answer. Leilani Mekahele. Her use of my full name lets me know that she is not pleased. I thought we raised you to be a good girl. 
and there it is. With one sharply edged comment, my mother has managed to make me feel like a complete and utter disappointment. I'm sorry, I finally whisper. Unable to think of anything to say to make this better, I click the end call button to hang up. Curling into the fetal position on my bed, I allow myself a long, cleansing cry. Chapter 2 Exhausted from my sob fest, I fall into a deep sleep. Without the protective guard that I keep perpetually staked around my heart, I dream of him. The dream is so vivid and feels so real, that even once I awaken, I have to convince myself that it hadn't really happened. Except that it had all happened, just a few weeks prior. It had been real, to me anyway. I had believed myself to be in love, or else I never would have behaved with such wild abandon. I thought he had loved me too. I had been willing to bet my heart on it. When Thomas Drake had breezed into our island hotel, my immediate reaction had been distaste. Maybe I should start trusting my gut. He had dirty blonde hair and a strong jawline. I found him to be incredibly handsome, despite the pompous way he carried himself. I was covering the front desk when he arrived to check in. I can remember every last detail of my first sighting of him. There was a balmy breeze blowing through the open concept lobby, bringing with it the faint scent of hibiscus, suntan lotion, and pineapple. He had an air of arrogance about him that only certain men from the mainland seemed to display. The rakish look and suggestive wink he gave me as I worked the computer and handed him his key made me crinkle my nose in distaste. People have always told me I am physically beautiful. Men are often quick to proposition me, based on looks alone. I have learned over time that this means nothing. True beauty resides on the inside, so someone who wants to be with me based simply on a first impression of my physical attributes, rather than getting to know me, holds no interest. An immediate turndown of any of these superficial advances usually results in the admirer quickly moving on to the next beautiful woman that crosses his path. Thomas Drake was not so easily dissuaded. That night at the hotel's luau, I noticed him watching every move I made during my traditional hula dance. I slowly swayed my arms and hips to the music. My movements told a story of fish swimming smoothly and synchronized in the sea as he sat motionless, mesmerized. I was used to this type of reaction and tried to quietly exit behind the stage after Honey's beautiful ukulele song, but before the show's finale of Kai's dazzling and dangerous fire-throwing routine. Thomas was too smart for that and was waiting for me to emerge. Attempting to brush past him, I stopped short when he called my name. He butchered it, of course. It came out like, Leilani, but I couldn't help being slightly impressed that he had remembered it at all. I hadn't mentioned my name to him at the front desk, and in the show the announcer had failed to use our names again, despite several requests to do so. We were introduced simply as the lovely trio. Thomas must have taken note when he saw it on my name tag at the front desk. I turned to correct his pronunciation of my name and was more affected than I probably should have been by the pleading look in his eyes when he asked me to join him for a walk on the beach. Trying to hold firm because I knew where this was headed, I said that I should get going and tried to leave again. Please? The quietly spoken word surprised me so much that I acquiesced still fully intending to bolt as soon as he started getting handsy. He didn't try to grope me, though. He just wanted to talk and ask questions and learn about me. When I answered, he seemed truly interested in everything I had to say. We sat on the white sandy beach listening to the surf roll in for hours, but it felt like only minutes as we laughed and talked, getting to know each other. I kept waiting for him to try to kiss me, but it didn't happen. He was the perfect gentleman. I felt completely shocked when the sun started to come up over the horizon. Tom had turned out to be sweet, humble and funny, the complete opposite of the pompous jerk that I had assumed him to be. It was a little disheartening to realize that I had been so quick to jump to an incorrect snap judgment about him. How many times had people done that to me, assuming that I was a pretty, but empty, headed shell of a person? And now I had done the same thing. 
When I admitted to Tom that I had guessed he would be an arrogant jerk, he confirmed that he had believed me to be a beautiful but bubble-headed bimbo. We both laughed about how wrong our initial conclusions had been and vowed not to be so quick to judge others in the future. I have to get going, or I'll be late for work, I finally decided. Sorry I kept you up all night, he replied sheepishly. I informed him that it was well worth it, gave him a swift peck on the cheek, and ran off beaming from ear to ear because I had just enjoyed the absolute best night of my life. Content just to hang out close by while I worked. He had some project that he was working on, but he fitted in around my schedule. He'd set up his laptop at a table by the pool, if I was working at the bar, chat on his cell phone in the lobby while I was at the front desk, or text like a maniac if I was acting as the hostess at the hotel buffet. He always seemed to have time to share a funny comment, toss me a silly face, or blow me a sweet kiss. His presence made my work shifts fly by. Then, we would spend the rest of the evening together laughing, getting to know each other better and having fun. We had held hands, but hadn't yet taken our relationship to a more physical level. My main worry was that he would be leaving soon. Apparently, that was everyone else's concern too, because both of my best friends since childhood, Kai and Honey, warned me to take it easy with Tom. I knew they were right, but felt physically and mentally unable to deny my growing attraction to him. Deciding to broach the topic directly, I asked Tom one afternoon when he would be leaving. I tried to keep my voice casual, even though I was waiting with bated breath for his response. His answer was simple. I don't know if I'll ever have the strength to leave you. His words made me feel warm and gooey inside. When he leaned in for our first kiss on the lips, I willingly complied. The urge to push him for a more specific answer was quickly forgotten. He was a marvelous kisser. His lips were tentative at first. After a few seconds they grew more confident, but somehow remained soft and pliable. When he parted them to flick his tongue out, I met it with mine, and we quickly became lost in our exploration of each other's mouths. Any coherent thoughts I had about him leaving were long gone. As luck would have it, that was a luau night, so I had to work later than usual. It pained me to be apart from him, even for a short while, but I knew he would be in the audience watching me. Watching me turned out to be a huge understatement. When I took the stage, I danced solely for Tom. Our eyes were locked together as I moved my body like the flowing wind. His lids were lowered as he gazed at me, unflinchingly enthralled. I was tempted to look away. His steady stare was so intent that it should have made me uncomfortable. Instead, it gave me a heady feeling. I felt powerful and desirable. I wanted him to look at me like that, like I was the only woman in the world. I wanted him to want me like he had never wanted anyone else. I wanted to be his. We had spent numerous nights together in my bungalow. He had started out sleeping curled on the hanging chair near my bed, but I had decided after the first night that it was a silly arrangement. He had joined me in my bed each night after that, but he had been an unfailing gentleman. He held me in his arms each night while we slept, but never attempted anything further. By some unspoken mutual agreement, we both knew that this night would be different. He traced the backside of his finger along my jawline as my shaking hands attempted to work the key in the lock of my door. When he leaned in to nibble on my earlobe, the intensity of his hot breath traveling along my neck made a thrilling chill race tantalizingly down my spine. He chuckled near my ear when the forgotten keys clattered on the tiled front porch. His laughter ended abruptly when I turned to him, taking his lips with mine in the boldest, most passionate kiss of my life. My hands found their way inside his shirt, and I heard his sharp intake of breath as I smoothed him lightly up his back. Let's take this inside. He breathed out as he bent to retrieve the keys, and made short work of unlocking and opening my door. For a brief moment as we walked inside, I considered telling him that this would be my first time. I had always considered my innocence to be a badge of honor. It was something that I was willingly giving to him, but I didn't want to put any extra pressure on him. I already knew from our glorious time spent together that he would be considerate and giving, 
but I didn't want him to feel like he had to make it perfect for me. It already felt perfect, because I was with the man I was falling in love with. Once inside we lunged at each other, and my concerns over telling him about my innocence quickly vanished. I became swept away, as we redacted. It was my first time seeing a redacted. His redacted, fascinated me. It was so redacted. You have to stop doing that if you want me to make it to the main event. He gasped, when I tentatively redacted. Did I do something wrong? I asked, concerned that what I had done was inappropriate. No baby. You do everything right. He reassured me, even as he redacted. All of my inhibitions seemed to float away, in a cloud of more intense pleasure, than I would have ever dreamed possible. My body redacted. All conscious thought left me as redacted. I redacted. Redacted. At my concerned look, he added, You feel amazing. First time, I responded in answer to his unasked question. The look he gave me then, absolutely melted me. He held himself steady just gazing into my eyes, then he began dropping sweet soft kisses down on my face. He showered my forehead, eyelids, cheeks, nose and lips with tender, loving kisses. He remained still, allowing me to savor the beautiful moment. Deciding he had held back long enough, I began to wiggle redacted. I rubbed my hands down his shoulders and redacted. Slowly and deliberately, he began redacted. Redacted. We quickly found redacted. We stayed like that for a long while, just enjoying the feeling of being redacted. I watched my white linen curtains billow out, carrying in the sea breeze. My body felt as relaxed as a pool of warm wax as redacted. The thirst that I hadn't known lived inside me was completely satiated. When he finally spoke, his words were wonderfully perfect and reassuring. Thank you for giving me the unopened gift of your body. I will treasure it always. Apparently, the two of us had differing opinions on exactly what that meant. The next few weeks were nothing short of glorious. We spent every moment together. We talked, we laughed, and we redacted. We were redacted. My fears and insecurities were long gone, and Tom proved to be a willing and knowledgeable teacher. I thought we were falling head over heels in love. I trusted him unconditionally. My unwavering faith in him probably made his betrayal sting even more. The fact that it seemed to come completely out of the blue didn't help matters either. We just had a particularly boisterous and lengthy redacted. It had been rowdy enough that I was certain I would blush furiously the next time I saw my neighbors, despite having closed my windows in an attempt to contain the redacted. When we weren't in the heat of the moment, the thought of anyone hearing our redacted embarrassed me immensely, but not enough to tone things down with Tom. I was so enamored with him that I didn't care what anyone else thought. Foregoing our usual cuddle session, he kissed me briskly on the forehead before arising and beginning to dress. I need to head out tomorrow. He said the remark casually, as if he were talking about running to the store for our favorite warm apple cinnamon donuts. You mean back to the mainland? I asked cautiously, even though my heart told me that couldn't possibly be what he meant. Yep. Again his response was far too casual. My mind was racing, seeking an explanation. Maybe he had some loose ends to tie up, and he would be back in a few weeks. Or maybe he was looking for a way to ask me to come with him. I didn't want to seem too desperate and clingy, so I tried to sound nonchalant as I asked, when will you be back? I really like it here. It is a tropical paradise after all. He swept a hand out to indicate the lush surroundings just outside my bedroom walls. So I'll probably make it a point to return sometime in the next few years. He finally turned to look at me, and his cold stare shocked me. This steely gaze was so different from the warm, loving looks I was so accustomed to receiving from him. I couldn't believe what he was saying, even though his aloof stance and glare confirmed his words. Years? I asked perplexed. At his curt nod, my head jerked back as if I had been slapped. Some sad part of me was waiting for him to ask me to come with him. I didn't want to give up my life here, but I couldn't bring myself to believe that he didn't want a future with me. What? 
His voice sounded snarky. Did you think I would give up my home and move here to live happily ever after with you? I'm not sure exactly what I had thought, but yes, it was something along those lines. I couldn't admit that to him now, though. I was at a complete loss for words. My eyelids fluttered quickly, as I tried to think of how to stop this nightmare from happening, and attempted to keep my impending tears from spilling over. Just as I was about to pathetically suggest that I could come visit him, he stopped me in my tracks. It's been a fun ride, babe, but now it's over. He sounded so casual. Did he not realize he was crushing my heart with his cruel words? He continued as if he had no idea the damage he was causing inside me. It's time to get back to the real world. There it was. I had just been a brief distraction to him. He hadn't had any real feelings for me. He had intended for our relationship to be temporary all along. My parents and everyone else who had warned me about falling for someone from the mainland had all been exactly right, but I had been too blinded by my own love-struck feelings to see it. Bye, babe. He said the words on his way out, without a backwards glance in my direction. I was so filled with rage that I threw my favorite vase, which had been holding three brightly-hued, fragrant hibiscus flowers that Tom had given me in his direction. He had already made his quick retreat, so the vase smashed into the door and splintered into a thousand tiny shards of glass. It was only a few weeks later when I found out that I was pregnant. Some silly, relentlessly hopeful side of me thought that when I told Tom about the baby, he would realize what a mistake he had made by leaving me. I had retrieved his phone number from the hotel's registration computer because he hadn't bothered to give it to me directly. It wasn't technically right for me to go snooping in his file, but I felt justified due to the extenuating circumstances. My fingers shook as I dialed his number. My stomach roiled, not only with my seemingly ever-present morning sickness, but also with nerves about what his reaction to hearing from me after all this time would be. I pushed it out of my mind that he knew exactly how to get a hold of me and could have easily reached out if he'd had a change of heart. Maybe he was nervous that I wouldn't be willing to take him back after the way he had unceremoniously dumped me. The wait for him to answer seemed interminable. When I finally heard his voice, it was all I could do to keep my pent-up tears from bursting out. His cool, Yes, what do you need? When I said my name, dashed any lingering hopes of an emotional, filled reconciliation. I matched his cool tone when I told him about the pregnancy. That jerk had the audacity to ask if it was his. He knew he took my innocence. Did he think I had already jumped into bed with someone else? Unbelievable. The line was silent for so long that I was beginning to think he had hung up on me. I wish that he had because the next words out of his mouth contained an offer to pay to get rid of it. My mouth literally hung open in shock at his reaction. He clearly didn't know me at all. This predicament hadn't been in my plans for the future and it isn't how I would have chosen for things to work out, but I hadn't even considered that option. When he told me to think about it, because it could make this whole messy problem go away, I hung up on him. He clearly wanted nothing to do with the baby or me, so we were better off without him. Forcing him into some sort of arrangement, financial or otherwise, would only give him a say in how the child was raised. After the way he treated me, I don't want him to have any influence in my baby's life. With his appalling reaction, he had effectively given up all rights to our unborn child. This baby will be mine and only mine. I vowed right then and there to love it with all of my heart and give it the best life I possibly can. I am still in the fetal position on my bed, but my hand is gently rubbing over my swollen tummy. This pregnancy out of wedlock is sure to alienate me from my family. It had already proven to me that the man I loved was not at all worthy of my affection. It would also make my job more challenging. After all, who wants to see a hula dance by a huge prego lady with cankles? None of that is my unborn child's fault though, and I have already grown to love my baby unconditionally. It's not the hand I would have chosen, but it is what I have been dealt. I will make it work, I decide 
just before leaning over to throw up in the giant bowl one keep beside my bed for exactly this purpose. You can let up on the morning, noon and night sickness. I say the words aloud to my belly once I finish heaving. Whoever had chosen the name morning sickness had seriously understated its proliferation. I get up to brush my teeth and shower, deciding that both might make me feel better. I can't stop thinking about Tom while I get cleaned up. I had neatly tucked those weeks of my life spent with him into a drawer that I had steadfastly refused to open. The dream about him opened the floodgates, and when I awoke, I had allowed myself to remember it all, the good, the bad, and the oh-so-ugly. As I shower, bits and pieces of my life with Tom replay dancing unwanted through my mind. I decide to allow myself this shower to ruminate over it, but once I turn off the water, I must close the door on those thoughts and feelings once more. I can do this. I will do this. I shut off the warm water and try to let Tom go. If I wait much longer, my protruding belly will be so obvious that they will figure it out on their own. I don't want that though. They deserve to hear about it directly from me. After all, we are the three musketeers, as others have called us since grade school. Honey prefers to refer to us as Harry, Ron, and Hermione from the Harry Potter book and movie series. His fascination with that story irks me more than a little, which is why I have never bothered to read the books or watch the movies. The fact that a grown man can be so fascinated with the children's story about magic and wizards blows my mind. Kai used to be on my side about the whole Harry Potter ridiculousness, but one night, Honey convinced him to start watching the dumb movies and he became hooked. Now they speak in some other language whenever the opportunity arises. Quidditch, Muggles, Mudbloods, and Polyjuice Potion. I don't know what any of it means, nor do I care to learn. It's infuriating. Sometimes I wish I had chosen female best friends so we could discuss manicures, purses, shoes, and periods. Then I look at the two big lugs that have been a vital part of my life for as long as I can remember, and warmth bubbles deep in my tummy. I love them both dearly, so I guess I can forgive their tendency to occasionally slip into a juvenile wizard language. I can't seem to ever catch the two of them together to share my news. We are all too busy lately. One evening when Kai is working late, I realize as I'm leaving the resort that Honey has the night off. I make the snap decision to stop by his tiny cottage on the cliff. If he's home, I'll take it as a sign that I should tell him. I'll just make him promise not to tell anyone until I've had a chance to fill in Kai. Even though his car is in the driveway, I find myself hoping that by some miracle, Honey isn't home. I almost chicken out and leave, rationalizing with myself that I should tell both guys at once. Knowing that is a difficult feat to accomplish without other prying ears listening at work, I take a deep, calming breath and slowly trudge to Honey's door. He is quick to answer my knock. When he realizes it's me, he breaks into one of his signature beaming smiles and engulfs me in a giant bear hug. He's big and warm and soft. His embrace feels incredibly comforting. We stand there in each other's arms for a long while. That's one of the great things about Honey. He is never in a hurry. Finally, I force myself to pull back. Hey big guy, I greet him. What you're up to tonight? Just watching a movie. He informs me. One glance at the people in pointed hats and robes on the paused screen tells me he is watching one of the Harry Potter movies again. I roll my eyes, but bite my tongue to keep from saying anything sarcastic. It's none of my business what he watches in his free time. Honey grabs the remote and powers off the television, clearly ready to give me his undivided attention. Suddenly, I'm overwhelmingly nervous. I can feel the sweat arising on my palms as I try to figure out how to share my news with him. I wish Kai would magically appear here. Things always seem easier with the three of us, more natural. Being alone with Honey has always made my stomach feel a little jittery. Speaking of that, my queasiness is beginning to escalate. It's usually an unsettled feeling that stays for the most part in the background, but I can feel it starting to upheave, letting me know it is quickly going to be front and center. I put a hand over my mouth and bolt for Honey's bathroom. 
I barely make it in time, so I am unable to pause to close the door behind me. As I'm hurling, I'm appalled to feel Honey behind me, lifting my long dark hair away from the back of my neck. The cool air on my neck feels delightful, but I do not want Honey to see this. I use one hand to shoo him away, even as the convulsions rack my body, but he ignores me. As soon as I finish, Honey retrieves a washcloth from his linen closet and lets cold water run over it. I'm mortified that I have thrown up in front of him, but allow him to help me up. He places his beefy arm around me, and we walk gingerly to the couch together. Once seated, he gives me a concerned look as he hands me the cool washcloth. Feeling better? Yeah, I confirm before adding, sorry about that. I didn't mean to walk into your house and vomit. I swipe the wet cloth over my face before setting it down. I know I haven't gotten around to cleaning this week, but I didn't think it was that bad in here. He teases me gently. I smile at his lame joke. Turning serious, he asks, You okay? I nod with the intention of saying yes, but I can feel the unwanted tears beginning to surface before I am able to utter the word. I shouldn't have come to see Honey. He is too kind. Too loyal. Too understanding. I don't want to admit to him the sticky situation I have gotten myself into. Shame and embarrassment flood my system. My fight-or-flight response kicks in, and I try to bolt out of my seat. Honey reaches out and grabs my arm before gently pulling me back down to the sofa. Tell me. His request is simple enough, but I struggle with a way to say what needs to be said. Finally, I decide to opt for direct and quick. I'm pregnant and Tom wants nothing to do with me or the baby, I blurt. I'll kill him. It is exactly the reaction I had been expecting, although gentle Honey doesn't have a violent bone in his body. He might look like a sumo wrestler, but he is, in actuality, a giant teddy bear. I know that he will do whatever it takes to protect me though. He is the most loyal person I know. Not wanting him to do anything he will regret, I shake my head vehemently. No. I say the word firmly, adamantly letting him know in no uncertain terms that he is not to go after Tom. He has made his choice, and he is the one who will be missing out. I lift my chin slightly, adding weight to my words. Honey nods slightly, seeming to accept my declaration, so I continue. I will raise this baby alone. I might not have any idea what I am doing, but I already love this child. I place a protective hand on my belly. I'll figure the rest out. I sound confident, even though I don't feel it at all. Honey tenderly places his huge hand over mine on my stomach. You don't have to do this alone. He reassures me. I had known that he and Kai would be there for me, but hearing his verbal confirmation felt like a soothing balm to my raw nerves. You and Kai will make terrific uncles. I smile at him. If that's what you wish. He is looking at me, intently. I sense that there is more that he wants to say, but he remains silent. Of course, I confirm. The baby will need some male influences in its life. I can't think of any better ones than you and Kai, I tell him honestly. I hope that you will both be a key part of this baby's life. He nods but remains silent as though deep in thought. When he finally speaks, his words blow me away. I will be as involved in your baby's life as you'll allow, Lonnie. He is one of only two people on earth who are allowed to call me that. Somehow, the shortened moniker has never bothered me coming from Honey or Kai. His silence stretches on again. He opens his mouth a couple of times to continue, but seems to rethink it each time. Eventually, he speaks. I'll raise this baby with you if you'll have me. His offer is impossibly sweet. He is such a good friend that he is willing to forego his life goals in order to help me with my predicament. I don't know why his quick and unselfish reaction surprises me. It shouldn't. That is the kind of upstanding, thoughtful, giving man that Honey is. His response is the one that I should have received from the father of my baby. Apparently, I have spent my entire life surrounded by the right kind of man, yet still somehow managed to choose Mr. Wrong, 
Mr. Horribly Painfully Wrong. While Honey's offer is tempting to accept, I can't be that kind of dead weight on his life. He deserves to be with someone who chooses him and wants to be with him. He should get to raise his own child, not a deadbeat father's. He is looking at me anxiously, probably in fear that I will take him up on his generous suggestion. I decide to relieve him of any doubt. No, but thank you. It was incredibly kind of you to volunteer. Does he look disappointed? You're an unbelievably kind man, I add to soften the rejection of his big-hearted proposal. We sit in silence for a while, each lost in our own thoughts. When he finally speaks, his words astound me again. If you don't want to be with me, I understand. I shake my head, intending to clarify my meaning, but he continues before I can. I still want to be an enormous part of this baby's life. I'll even raise it on my own if that is what you want, and I promise to love it like my own child. I am stunned into silence. Why would he be willing to do this? I know he is a wonderful friend, but this is way above and beyond the bonds of friendship. Answering my unasked question, Honey continues. You are meant for greatness, Lani. I don't want anything to get in your way. I wonder what he means by this, but before I can ask, he goes on. I'm just an average fellow, but I will make a superb father. If you're not ready to be a parent, I am, and I will. I'm fully committed, and I will love this baby with all of my heart. His big-hearted offer flabbergasts me. I know that he cares deeply for me, as I do him. I also know that one day he will make a fantastic father. Why he would be willing to step in and act as my baby's father is beyond me, though. It is so far above and beyond what I would have expected him to say that I am uncertain of exactly how to respond. We are silent for a bit before he adds, We can even tell people I am the baby's biological father if it will help explain my level of involvement. Seeming to rethink this, he quickly says, If you won't be embarrassed to have people think you were intimate with me. My eyes dart to him then. Is that really what he thinks? I wonder. He gives me a sad smile and indicates his hefty body. Then he mutters, I'm not exactly your type. Letting me know that is exactly what he believes. Wanting to set him straight immediately, I say, Honey, any woman would be lucky to have you, including me. I smile shyly and feel my cheeks burning over the last part. He shakes his head at my reassurance. I know that I don't have Kai's looks or charm. In fact, me and everyone else we know can't believe that the two of you haven't gotten together. He's a perfect match for you. Kai is undeniably gorgeous. There is no refuting that. Honey is not as traditionally good-looking, but he is handsome in his own right. His sweet, big-hearted, gentle soul serves to make him even more attractive. I start to tell him that, but sense that he won't believe me. Kai and I are just friends, I utter for what seems like the thousandth time. Everyone seems to make that same misguided assumption, but I hadn't thought Honey would. He knows the two of us too well. He nods, but I'm uncertain if he truly believes me. Just like you and I are the best of friends. I place my hand over his before continuing. Which is why I could never accept your wonderful and benevolent offer. He starts to object, but I raise my other hand to stop him. It is an impossibly generous suggestion, and I'm beyond tempted to take you up on it, but I can't take away your chance at love and happiness. It wouldn't be fair. It's my choice, Honey says before adding, Besides, I do love you and I'll love your baby. We could all be happy together. I realize that I need to leave before he talks me into accepting his offer. It seems like the best possible outcome from the situation I have created, but I can't do that to Honey. I won't. He deserves to follow his destined path for finding love and nurturing a family, instead of fixing up my mess. I love you too, I tell him honestly. His eyes light up at my words. You are the most amazing friend I could ask for. I have to look away when I see his hurt expression. Hurting Honey is the last thing in the world I would ever want. I quickly continue. That's why I cannot take you up on your offer. 
It would be taking advantage of your kindness, and I refuse to do that. I got myself into this mess, and now it's time to pay for my sins. You deserve so much more than I can give you. With that, I get up and turn to leave. Honey stops me in my tracks by saying, I'm always here if you need me. I do anything for you. I have no doubt in the sincerity of his words, which is exactly why I can't let him. It is so tempting to stay here and let Honey comfort me. I know that he would take care of me and my baby, but that wouldn't be right or fair to him. I'm glad my back is turned, so he can't see my face crumple to tears as I walk out his door and shut it behind me. It is one of the hardest things I have ever had to do. Once in my car, I allow the tears to flow freely. I know in my heart that I have done the right thing, but it still feels horribly, wretchedly wrong. About, other than the what could have beens that keep flashing in my head regarding Honey. I'm certain that the mental image of the two of us happily caring for a cooing baby is just my mind playing tricks on me. Honey feels obligated as one of my best friends to offer to help me out of a tough situation. I can't accept his overly generous gift with a clear conscience. It is too much to ask. I have to keep reminding myself of these facts because I'm tempted to call Honey and tell him that I would love to raise the baby with him. I search nearly the entire property, but can't seem to locate Kai. I'm fairly certain that he's not in the restaurant, but that is the only place I haven't been. I had been putting off going there, because I know Honey is in there waiting tables. Promising myself to remain strong, I take a deep breath and enter the building. Immediately, I hear Honey's distinctive high-pitched laugh and spot him chatting it up with the three new arrivals who seem to have taken the resort by storm. Rumor has it that the tall, beautiful one showed up here wearing a tattered wedding gown. Kai has been sniffing around her ever since. The cute, bubbly sister and wild, outspoken grandmother who came with the jilted bride have already been managing to stir up trouble everywhere they go. I shake my head deciding that I'll have to get the scoop on these three characters later. Right now, I have one more person to tell about my pregnancy before he hears it from someone else. Not seeing any sign of the man in question, I rush over to Honey. Grabbing his arm to steal his attention from the three troublemakers he is waiting on, I say, Honey, do you know where Kai is? I need to talk to him. I don't bother explaining what it is about because Honey is already aware and I don't need any input from the three busybodies that are currently gawking at me with wide-eyed stares. I can't help but notice the disappointed look that flashes on the face of Kai's rumored infatuation at my mention of his name, but I don't have time right now to clear things up with her. Besides, he really doesn't need to be getting too involved with a tourist, especially not one who was ready to walk down the aisle with another man. Then again, Considering my current situation, who am I to judge when it comes to matters of the heart? It would be difficult for anyone to mess up things more royally than I have somehow managed to. Honey doesn't have any suggestions for Kai's whereabouts that I haven't already tried, so I give up. Either I will run into him sometime today, or I'll see him tonight at the luau. I just hope no one spills the beans or baby formula. I grin at the silly joke that popped into my head before I have a chance to tell him myself. The front desk is extremely busy with checkouts, check-ins, questions about the area, and calls for reservations. The steady stream of requests doesn't let up all day, so I am surprised when I hear the announcer start the luau. The evening shift had arrived earlier, but we had been so overwhelmed with guests that I hadn't left. Not wanting to be late for my dance, I race quickly outside to the grove yanking off my floral front desk sweater as I go. An older gentleman stops to watch me run past. He cups his hands to yell, Feel free to take off the other shirt too. I wait until I'm backstage to do that. Having done the show more times than I can count, I have become a quick change artist. I hide in a corner so I can discreetly slip into my coconut bra and grass skirt. Standing behind the other girls at the mirror, I slick some lip gloss over my pout, pinch my cheeks, tousle my long raven-colored hair, and am ready to go on stage with 15 seconds to spare. Once my dance is over, I stand just off stage watching the other acts. 
When Kai finishes his dazzling fire-throwing routine, I'll be here to intercept him. He is not getting away without hearing my news, I bow to myself. I just hope that someone hasn't beaten me to the punch. After his death-defying act, Kai returns backstage, immune to the raucous applause from the audience. He smiles warmly at me before moving to slide past. I am certain he intends to go find the disheveled bride, I really need to find out her name. I had been watching her from backstage while Kai performed. She had been absolutely captivated by him. She will have to wait her turn though. I need him now. Grabbing his arm I say, we need to talk. He follows me unquestioningly. Deciding we need to get away from people, I head out towards the pristine beach, which is now shrouded in darkness. I'm fairly certain that he doesn't already know about the pregnancy, or he would have tracked me down, likely to give me a lecture. Kai thinks of himself as my big brother, much more than my actual big brother does. Most of the time, I like his tendency to watch over me. When I'm getting ready to confess that I am pregnant by a man who wants nothing to do with me, or the child, I'd prefer he wasn't quite so protective. We reach the smooth sand and I turn to tell him. Suddenly, my throat is as dry as a sauna in the Sahara. Kai lifts his eyebrows, clearly wanting me to get on with it. Um, I start. I scratch my forehead nervously. This isn't exactly the eloquent speech I had planned. I'm pregnant. For two such simple words, they sure have a way of knocking the wind right out of people. Kai looks like I have just punched him in the gut. The tourist. He spits the word out like it pains his mouth to even utter it. He already knows the answer to his question, but I nod in confirmation anyway. I'm going to kill him. I can't refrain from smiling. Kai's bullheaded initial reaction identically mirrors Honey's. They are two peas in a pod, and I am so lucky to have them in my life. That's not the answer, I remind him. Does he know? Is he coming back here? Are you moving away? I can practically see the wheels turning as Kai works to process my news. A panicked look crosses his face at the last question. He knows, and he wants nothing to do with me or the baby. The anger is bellowing off of him in waves. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see steam spout from his ears. Don't worry, I tell him. I'll figure it out and make it work. I sound more confident than I feel. Does Honey know? At my nod, he asks. Is he okay? What an odd question. Shouldn't he be asking if I'm okay? I'm a little taken aback by his concern for Honey. It seems misplaced. Maybe he isn't thinking quite clearly. He hasn't had a chance to process the bombshell I just dropped on him. Honey is fine. I answer a little more sharply than I intended to. Except that he's gone a little loopy and offered to raise the baby with me. Kai's face turns pale. Did you let him down easy? Let him down? I'm sure he was relieved to be let off the hook. At Kai's serious look, I continue. He was only offering out of some misguided notion that it's the right thing for a friend to do. I could never let him make that big of a sacrifice for me. Maybe he wouldn't consider it a sacrifice. Kai inserts before changing topics. Are you sure you want to keep the baby? This can't be how you wanted your life to turn out. This is a game changer. There are other options. This is so not the reaction that I had been expecting from brave always do the right thing Kai. I feel as though he has slapped me in the face. I had briefly considered giving the baby up for adoption when I first found out, but since accepting the news, I had grown to love the life that is growing inside me. I'm shocked that Kai would suggest that I not keep it. This baby is the most important thing in the world to me Kai. I inform him. I'm not giving it up, I say vehemently, before turning away from him and running back towards the resort. I notice Kai's rumored lady friend squatting behind a bush not far down the path. Wondering if she was within earshot for all or part of our conversation, I briefly consider stopping to explain. Deciding that she is Kai's problem and that she really shouldn't be spying on people anyway, I keep going. My shoulders, 
I decide it's too late to worry about his feelings about my lifelong friends now. It's not like I could give them up if he wanted me to. I wouldn't even consider it. I thought I would feel enormous relief at having those closest to me know the secret I had been keeping for what seems like forever, but hasn't actually been all that long. Instead, the weight on my chest feels as elephant-like as ever. Maybe it is just heartburn, and I'm confusing the feeling with anxiety? Having never before experienced heartburn, I can't be certain, but it sounds like a good description for my current state. I have the morning off, but I refuse to sit around moping. Realizing that sometimes a lady just needs her daddy, I decide to pop by to visit mine at the pineapple plantation where he has worked his entire adult life. My nerves are jittery, and I begin to feel completely frazzled as I drive. I know my father is not pleased with me, but I can't allow my poor judgment to erect a wall in our relationship. It is my responsibility to reach out and make things right with him. The frightening question that keeps floating unwanted to the front of my brain is, what if he shuns me? My father is a proud man. If he decides that I have brought shame onto our family, he will not be quick to forgive, and he will never forget. Since I have the windows rolled down on my little Honda, to let the unseasonably cool breeze waft over me as I drive, I smell the fresh pineapples long before I see the plantation. The aroma is sweet and familiar. It reminds me of my father and makes me grin despite my qualms. I inhale deeply and assure myself that this will work out. It has to. He will forgive me. I make this my mantra as I find a spot to squeeze into in the busy parking lot. My father has always been the undisputed leader in our household. It makes my feminine hackles rise a little, but I try not to be too judgmental of them. If he finds it in his heart to forgive me, my mother will follow suit. It's just the way they operate, and it seems to work well for them. I don't bother heading out to the fields, because I can tell by the large crowd gathered around the tasting booth that my father is working his magic. He has a real knack for entertaining the inquisitive tourists that come to visit the plantation each day. Scooting into a space towards the back of the crowd, I watch my father perform his shtick. Even though I've seen him do this same routine dozens of times, I never tire of watching. His dark eyes gleam as he chooses an unsuspecting tourist to razz a little. He finds his prey, a tall man whose wife and kids clap excitedly. The man looks thrilled that he has been selected. The man waves to his family as he joins my father at the counter and faces the crowd. Rather stiffly, he states his name and declares himself to be from Kansas City before my father asks him to help prepare some pineapples for the gathered crowd to sample. The unsuspecting man quickly agrees. My father hands him a sharp knife with an appropriate warning not to chop off any appendages. This earns him a horrified look from the man's wife and a few chuckles that murmur through the audience. I sense when my father spots me in the crowd. I can feel his eyes bore into me for a moment before he jumps back into his routine, without missing a beat. I don't know what to make of his initial reaction to my being there. He hadn't graced me with the loving smile that usually accompanies my visits. I swallow the lump in my throat while willing myself not to throw up and ruin the pineapple tasting. The counter has been set up in advance. Each man has a cutting board and five pineapples. Would you be so kind as to slice these five juicy and delicious pineapples for our guests to enjoy? The man nods agreeably, so my father sets about the business of showing him how it's done. After slicing the top off his first pineapple, my dad cuts through the thick rind and fruit so quickly his knife almost blurs. He places his perfectly proportioned pieces on a serving tray and gestures to the crowd as if to say, ta-da, without actually saying a word. The onlookers clap appropriately at his adept handiwork. Having made the feat look utterly effortless, my father indicates the man standing beside him, letting him know it's his turn. Looking overly confident, the man attempts to slice his first pineapple. Of course, it isn't nearly as easy as my father has made it look, with his 30 years of experience on his side. The crowd giggles as expected as my father slices two additional pineapples, while the good-natured tourist continues to struggle with his first. 
Pretending to have figured out the problem, my father over-exaggerates his motions as he makes a production of trading knives with the man. Naturally, this doesn't help a bit. My father now has all of his pineapples perfectly sliced, while the tourist only has a few unevenly cut pieces from his first. Jovially taking over, my father makes short work of the rest of the pineapples and suggests that the man stick with his day job. To prove that his heckling has all been in good fun, Dad has the crowd cheer for the man as he sheepishly returns to the audience. He then makes a point to let everyone know that this man and his family will be awarded the first samples of the freshly cut fruit. Everyone laughs again when the family comes forward, and he hands them the awkwardly cut slices the man had managed to finish. Slices are passed all around, as well as napkins to catch the juice now sliding down several people's chins. I hear several murmurs about the delicious fruit. Most are along the lines of it being the sweetest, most flavorful fruit they have ever tasted. I smile, knowing exactly how they feel. Even with as much fresh pineapple as I've eaten over my lifetime, I'm still awed by its wonderful flavor. Once the crowd disperses to tour the plantation by trolley or peruse the gift shop, I am left alone with my father. I watch him methodically wipe the counter clean of sticky pineapple juice. Since I know that he will want to have his say first, after the bombshell news I dropped on him, I wait for him to talk. He finally speaks, without looking up. I'm glad you came, Kiki. Relief courses through me at his words. Even if he is still angry, it is clear that I will eventually be forgiven. The fear that he wouldn't be able or willing to ever let my perceived betrayal go had been weighing heavily on me since finding out about my pregnancy. I hadn't realized how much I had been worried about it until he released me of that burden. Smiling, I wait for him to close the tasting booth and join me. He opens his arms wide and engulfs me in a wonderful hug. Tears of gratitude spring unwanted into my eyes at his loving reaction. He is being much more understanding than I would have ever imagined possible. I manage to keep my tears from spilling over, but it takes all of my concentration. When he pulls back, he says, I'm not old enough to be a tutu cane, am I? His eyes are twinkling, letting me know that he is teasing. He is, of course, plenty old enough to be a grandfather, but I decide that right now might not be the best time to point that fact out to him. He suggests that I find us a seat outside, while he goes to the snack bar to get us ice cream cones. When I mention that it's a little early for the frozen treat, he waves off my concern by saying, It's always a good time for ice cream. I can't argue with that logic, so I go save us a spot at an umbrella table. He brings me what has been one of my favorite treats since childhood, pineapple soft serve with coconut shavings on top. It is just as delicious as I remember, and it brings back a flood of wonderful memories of visiting my dad at work. I hope that my child will one day be able to do the same. Interrupting my thoughts, Dad asks, So, are you hoping for a boy or a girl? The question catches me off guard because I haven't really thought about it. Usually, when I think about the baby, it is as just that, a baby. Gender hasn't made its way into my daydreams yet. I pause to allow myself to ponder his question. I'm fairly certain my father would prefer a boy. I visualize a dirty, gap-toothed, adorable little boy climbing onto my lap for sweet snuggles before running off to his next adventure. The mental image makes me smile. Next, I ponder getting a pedicure next to a roughly sparkly pint-sized princess. Having my own mini-me would be so much fun. I, I don't know. I answer my father's question honestly. Either would be fine, I guess. As an afterthought, I add, as long as it's healthy. My dad says the tired phrase along with me. Well, no matter what gender the baby is, he continues, his voice sounding much more stern. It needs a father. I had known this was coming, but I wasn't sure what I could say or do about the lack of a father situation at this point. He saves me from having to answer by continuing with his own train of thought. Shaking a finger at me, he adds, Not that shaka-tossing idiot either. I can't help bursting into laughter at my father's out-of-character proclamation. 
Tom had been fond of greeting people with the hang loose hand symbol, thumb and pinky up. I should have realized that my father wouldn't appreciate a mainlander coming here, and thinking he knew our culture or heritage well enough to even understand what the shaka means, let alone having the audacity to flash it to everyone he meets. I guess love, or rather what I had mistaken as love, really did make me blind. Once my giggles subside, I nod at my dad, who seems to be waiting for an answer regarding the baby needs a father issue. The vague gesture must have appeased him, because he stands and pulls me up for another hug. Mahalo, Makuakane, I tell him, and I mean it. You're welcome, sweet girl. Now let me get back to work, before I get fired for visiting with my Ohana all day. With that he is gone. I watch him put on his visor hat and walk out to the field. I am surprised by how easily he has forgiven me. I also know that my mother will follow his lead. Since he has pardoned my indiscretion, she will too. My brother is probably too busy catching the next wave to care either way, but it is wonderful to know that my Ohana supports me. Family is everything to me, both the one I was born into, and the two men who are my lifelong friends and chosen family. Feeling abundantly blessed, I drive back to the resort. If I had known what the next 24 hours would bring, I would have stayed with my dad. More burning questions than answers. Having thought about my situation the entire drive back, I decide to take advantage of the midday lull between breakfast and lunch, when guests are getting cleaned up and making their plans for the day. I track down Honey and Kai to let them know we need a trio powwow. They both follow me unquestioningly out to the beach. Seizing the opportunity to indulge in the best loofer in the world, I remove my shoes and let my toes sink into the fine pale sand. It feels luxurious, so I attempt to focus on that, rather than the potentially life-altering discussion I am about to have. Even though they both probably have a million other things they could be doing, neither man attempts to rush me into talking. We all gaze out at the crystal clear turquoise water, watching the foamy waves crash into shore. A dark cloud is making its way to our island, likely bringing with it a 20-minute shower of cooling, life-sustaining rain. To look at the three of us, a bystander, would think we have all the time in the world. Knowing that we don't, I take a deep breath and dive in. You're probably wondering why I called you out here. It had been a while since any of us had called an official meeting. They nod, but patiently wait for me to continue. I've been doing a lot of thinking. This fact was probably already painfully obvious to them, especially considering my current condition, but they refrain from saying so. I've been thinking about Honey's generous offer to help raise my baby. I can feel Honey's eyes intently boring into me, but I am not looking at him. I am watching Kai, trying to gauge his reaction. Kai's face will let me know if I am overstepping my bounds. I don't want to take advantage of Honey's kindness, and it is hard to tell if my desperate situation is clouding my judgment. Unfortunately, Kai is hard to read as he watches Honey. We probably look like a ridiculous triangle, each of us looking at another, desperate to know what the person is thinking, no one returning the gaze. Swallowing the lump in my throat, I forge on. If you are still willing, I would love for us to raise this baby together. My heart is hammering in my chest as I turn to Honey. The hope-filled look in his deep brown eyes melts me as I silently pray that I am doing the right thing for all of us. I can see tears glistening as Honey nods at me in silent affirmation of our agreement. Deciding to give him one last chance to back out, I rush on. I don't want to take advantage of you or our friendship. Taking his hand, I plead with him. If you are just doing this for me, please don't. I only want to accept your offer, if it's what you want. It's what I want. Honey confirms. His voice sounds croaky, filled with emotion. Deciding to point out the major flaw with our plan in case he hasn't fully considered it, I ask, what about your future wife? What will she think about you having so much baggage, a child and best friend, who also happens to be the mother of your child? For the first time since we started this discussion, Honey breaks his gaze from me. Looking down, he seems to be pondering what his response should be. 
I wait anxiously, desperately hoping that I hadn't just talked him out of joining me in this adventure. I turn to Kai, but he is still staring intently at Honey, so I do the same. Well. Honey arcs his sandaled foot back and forth in the sand before raising his eyes to me. I guess she'll just have to deal with it, because you and this baby are an enormous and important part of my life. And you always will be. I feel like bursting with joy when Honey blesses me with one of his trademark ear-to-ear -ear beaming smiles. He looks so happy that Kai and I can't help but join him. We stand there for a bit, grinning goofily at one another. Being the ever-practical one, Kai breaks up our giddy revelry. Okay, we need to hatch a plan. Unsure what he means, Honey and I both turn to him for clarification. We need to decide on the backstory. What is our party line? Everyone saw Lani with Thomas. Do we want to admit he is the father? Or should we say the baby is Honey's? People will wonder why Honey is so involved in the baby's life. Should we say that you two dated for a bit and broke things off? What are we going to tell the baby when it is old enough to start asking questions about its father? We need to try to keep the damage to Lonnie's reputation, to a minimum. He pauses to look at me then, knowing that I wouldn't appreciate the fact that our community judges women so harshly. Knowing that it is just a fact of life in our social circle, I nod at him sadly and he continues. It is essential that we decide what we want people to believe and that we all stick with the story we agree upon. Clearly, Kai had already given this a lot of thought. He had raised some excellent points. Shouldn't we just stick with the truth? I ask them. Honey turns to me. Are you certain that Thomas won't decide later that he wants to be a part of the baby's life? He spat Tom's name like it physically pained him to utter the word. I'm positive. I nod sadly to add even more emphasis to my affirmation. The three of us remain lost in our own thoughts until Honey weighs in with his opinion. I think if it's okay with you. He turns to look directly at me, our hands still interlocked. That the baby should be mine. Otherwise, everyone will wonder why I am so involved. It also saves you the embarrassment of having people speculate about the baby's real father. I am surprised by his answer. He is obviously fully committed to his decision. There won't be any backing out of it once people think he is the baby's father. Lots of people know she was with Tom. Kai points out. Do we really want them thinking she was fooling around with him, then quickly jumped into your bed? They are talking about me and my situation like I am not even here. I don't like it. No one knows for sure that I was with Tom physically, other than my parents. Thinking about their reaction, I decide, they would be thrilled to not have to admit their daughter is knocked up and has been dumped by a mainlander. The optics are better if we say Honey is the father. Kai weighs in. People will forget all about Tom soon enough. The story can be that you guys went on a couple of dates, things went too far one night, you mutually decided you were better off as just friends, but Lonnie was already pregnant. Honey is stepping up to do the right thing. Lonnie just had a momentary lapse in judgment with a lifelong friend. The baby ends up with a doting father, who is a major part of its life. I think it's the best case scenario for everyone involved. I am not fond of the way Kai is talking about this, like a tactical military operation. I had wanted him here for his unbiased opinion, but now that he is giving his thoughts, it feels like he is overstepping his bounds. Ignoring him, I focus on Honey. What if you change your mind down the road? What if you want a family of your own, and we hold you back? I won't change my mind. Honey reassures me, vehemently. I want to be the father to your baby. He seems so sincere. I want to believe him, but it seems too good to be true. Why would he want to do this? Is he giving up too much? There's only one problem with this plan. Honey decides. I'm sure that he is rethinking his willingness to tie himself so permanently to me and my child, but instead he says, Who would believe that Lonnie would be intimate with me? He indicates his large frame. His words break my heart. 
Honey has always been overly self-conscious about his size and his high-pitched voice, but I hadn't realized that he felt undesirable. We all have aspects of ourselves that we judge too harshly and find to be inferior, but most people manage to believe that someone will love them, flaws and all. Are Honey's insecurities so deeply ingrained that he finds himself to be unlovable? Does he really believe I wouldn't want to be with him because of his physical characteristics? Wanting to immediately tamp down his self-loathing, I say honestly, Honey, any woman would be lucky to be with you, including me. He is looking down, so I squeeze his hand with mine to relay the sincerity of my words. You are the most kind, generous, loving, hilarious, talented dorky, his head pops up at the last one, but I finish my sentence, man I know. You were doing great, until you got to the dorky part. Kai informs me. Well, you're right there with him on the high end of the dorkiness scale, now that he has converted you into a wizarding world fiend. They both chuckle at my ribbing, and it lightens the mood considerably. We are on more familiar territory now. They are used to me making fun of their Harry Potter obsession. You don't know what you are missing. Kai informs me, taking my other hand. The three of us turn to walk slowly back to the resort. Flanked on either side by my two best friends, I feel safe and loved. I am confident that I am giving my baby the best possible version of the future. When we reach the resort's pool area, it is time to part ways. By some unspoken agreement, we do the secret Three Musketeers handshake, which we haven't done since elementary school. With that gesture, our agreement on our version of the truth is sealed. An almost childlike exuberance for life that will be wonderful to share with our little one. He is patient, kind, honest, giving, and fun. Our baby is lucky to have him in its life, and so am I. Things would be as perfect as could be under the circumstances, except for the constant niggling fear in my brain. Is Honey giving up too much? Am I taking advantage of him? Should I have resisted the temptation to accept his offer? The odd sight I encounter as I travel the sand-covered path to the resort's front desk distracts me from my worry-filled train of thought. I encounter one eye warily peering around the corner of the water sports cabana. Pausing to see what is going on, I see a hand slowly rise into the air, with its thumb and pointer finger extended into a mock handgun. Deciding whatever is happening isn't a true threat, I take a few steps forward. Just as I reach the corner of the building, the woman attached to the finger gun jumps out at me shouting, Gotcha! I had been expecting a youth, due to the diminutive height of the peering eyeball and the childish antics. The tiny silver-haired lady squints at me suspiciously, her air gun pointing in my direction. I recognize her as Kai's love interest's crazy grandma. The woman's reputation precedes her, because I have already heard from several people about her wild behavior around the resort. You're not the big fettuccine, she announces, seeming perplexed. Then she cocks her head to the side, her wheels obviously turning. Or are you? She makes a big sweeping motion to grab at my hair, trying to yank it off as if it is a wig. Ow! I screech at her. Stop that! I have to forcibly restrain her but she maintains her hold on my hair. She seems stunned that it isn't a wig. I try to be gentle as she struggles against me. Her arm feels thin and brittle in my grasp. I am distracted from holding her back when a lanky man comes running to her aid. Did you get him? He pants from the exertion of his brief jog. Recognizing him as the old codger who suggested that I take off all of my clothes as I was removing my sweater on the way to the luau the other night, I am not surprised that these two oddballs have managed to find each other. Let her go. He furrows his bushy eyebrows at me. Tell her to stop trying to pull out my hair, I fire back. This isn't the big fettuccine. He confirms, and for some reason the tiny spitfire believes him and releases her hold on my hair. I reciprocate by letting go of her arm. I hope that my grip won't leave a bruise on her thin age spot-covered skin, but she really hadn't left me any choice. Even though she didn't seem to believe it, my hair is attached to my head. Now that the physical roughness has died down, I get a good look at the two of them. 
Their scantily clad bodies both have loose bronze skin that appears to be the texture of leather, and they reek of coconuts. The smell is so strong, I wonder if they've been rolling in coconut oil. At this point nothing would surprise me with these two. The man pulls the woman into his arms and assures her that she'll get the big fettuccine next time. He leans down to give her a sweet kiss on the cheek. I try not to notice that his hands slide down to redacted as I attempt to slip around them and continue my trek to the front desk. Shaking my head, I wonder if these two truly believe they are spies. They must have fallen from the same variety of crazy tree. Maybe the strong coconut odor emanating from them went to their heads and made them nutty. Whatever the case, I'm glad they have each other. I guess there really is someone out there for everyone. Just when I begin to hope I have escaped any further interaction with them this morning, I hear the woman chasing after me. Hold up. She pants as her sandals click, clack quickly behind me. Her words make me think she might be playing with her finger gun again. Exasperated, I stop and turn around to see what she wants now. I really just want to go to work and not have to deal with any more of her shenanigans, but she is a guest at the resort, so I need to treat her respectfully. I have a bone to pick with you, she informs me sternly as soon as she catches up with me. Although she is nearly a foot shorter than me, she has the audacity to poke her pointer finger into my sternum as she closes in on my personal space. She has a bone to pick with me. It is all I can do to keep from losing my patience with the tiny she, devil. Instead, I raise my eyebrows in question, wondering what her problem is now. Are you blind? She asks me cryptically. Um, no. I have no idea what she is trying to imply, and I really don't have time for this. If you're not blind, why can't you see how wonderful that big hunk of man meat is? She squints her eyes, inspecting me carefully. I shift my stance, incredibly uncomfortable with her scrutiny and confused by her question. What are you talking about? Honey, don't you see it? She rolls her eyes skyward as if I am completely clueless. That giant beefcake looks at you like you are an extra-large pepperoni pizza with a hot fudge sundae on top, she informs me. If he looked at me like that, I'd be happy to give him a taste, if you know what I'm saying. She uses her elbow to nudge my side as she waggles her eyebrows. I am pretty sure that I do know what she is suggesting, and I prefer not to think about her and Honey together. The mental image that pops unwanted into my head is enough to make my morning sickness flare up, and I don't want to vomit pineapple ice cream on this crazy woman's feet. She continues on, as if she hasn't just made a completely inappropriate comment. She seems to be mulling over something as she taps a finger on her lips. Evidently coming to a conclusion, she informs me, You know, he might have a little bit of dicky doo disease. At my confused frown she continues, That's okay though. My first husband had a bad case of it, but we were creative and managed to work around it. I have absolutely no idea what she is talking about. I'm not completely sure that I even want to know. My stomach drops at the thought that Honey might be sick, but how would this crazy bat know about it? Deciding I need clarification on what she means, I ask, he might have what? You know, Dicky Doo disease. She is looking at me again, like I am totally dense. Leaning in, she stage whispers. It's when their belly sticks out farther than their dicky do. Beyond annoyed with this utterly ridiculous and wildly outrageous woman, I turn on my heel to walk quickly away from her. I can hear her cackling loudly behind me as she yells, Don't let that stop you, though. He's still a great catch. Quickly, the name fits the person. Roxy, Kai's love interest and Baggy's granddaughter, evidently came up with the mangled name when she was just a toddler and it was so fitting that it stuck. Maybe this Roxy person isn't so bad, I decide, smiling. At least she seems to see her grandmother for the troublemaker that she is. Kalia's eyes light up as she tells me about some of the funny antics the older woman has pulled in her short time here, everything from unabashedly hitting on men a quarter her age, to shaking her coconut bra-covered tatas on the dance floor, 
to asking the concierge if a man's tallywhacker has ever been bit off when he was skinny, dipping in the ocean. For that last one, Kalia jiggles her pointer finger in an impression of baggy, telling the shocked attendant that men's wiggly little bits look like shark bait underwater. It's obvious by her expression that Kalia is already very fond of the crazy lady. I don't get it. Baggy is obnoxious, delusional, and on the verge of being downright rude. Why does everyone seem to like her so much? Shaking my head, as Kalia heads back to the kitchen, I can't help but wonder what the appeal of this woman is. Deciding to find something positive to focus on, I admit that things will never be boring with her around to keep us all on our toes. Even though the vast majority of what Baggy said annoys me, I can't stop thinking about one of her comments. She seems to be under the impression that Honey thinks of me as more than just a friend. Could she be right, or is that just more of her crazy showing? All day, I attempt to tamp down my curiosity but it just won't go away. Both Baggy and Kai have now insinuated that Honey might want a romantic relationship with me. I have never before thought about the concept of us being a couple. I keep telling myself that it's a crazy idea because taking that chance could ruin the amazing friendship we have spent so many years building, but the notion keeps popping back into my mind. I'm sure I only keep thinking about it because of the pregnancy and Honey's generous offer to raise the baby with me. A romance between the two of us would tie things up with a nice pretty bow, but it would be for the wrong reasons. I can't be with Honey just because he is convenient and kind. I won't use him like that. Every time I remember that woman's comments about the size of Honey's privates in relationship to his belly, I become infuriated. It was so wrong of her to insinuate. Besides, what does she know about the size of his manhood? I've never before allowed myself to picture what he would look like naked, but I'd be willing to bet he doesn't have that disease. I smile at the naughty turn my thoughts have taken. It's not at all like me to think about such things at work, especially not about Honey. Attempting to rein in my curiosity, I think about the rest of his body. Honey is big. There is no denying that. But he's not really what anyone would call fat either. Maybe he is what would be referred to as big, boned. His hands and fingers are large, he has a beefy chest as well as strong shoulders and arms. He doesn't have rock-hard abs, but his belly isn't that big. He also has enormous feet, which are an indicator that he most definitely does not suffer from that dicky do problem. And there it is again, so much for distracting myself from thinking about his jewels at work. I'm not sure how I'll face Honey again after having spent the afternoon visualizing what he looks like naked. At least he won't know about the wayward thoughts I've been having about him. Will he? I'm pretty sure the guilt will creep up my face like a crimson red sign the next time I see him. I have to stop thinking about this. It's like that awful woman has poisoned my brain, and now all I can think about is Honey. The same questions keep floating through my mind. Does Honey have romantic feelings for me? Do I want him in that way? Would we make a good couple? Would a romance end up ruining our friendship? Or would it make us even better parents? And the unanswered questions that embarrass me the most but keep raising their ugly heads. His manhood sticks out farther than his belly, right? If it doesn't, what sort of creative solutions was Baggy talking about? Should I get some ideas and tips from her? Blast that woman for making me think this way. Her crass inappropriateness has already rubbed off on me. I shake my head vigorously, trying to remove her and her unfounded musings from my brain. It works for the rest of my shift, but I have the evening off from work, and I can't seem to stop thinking about the possibility of a relationship with Honey that goes beyond friendship. It feels like the perfect answer, but I want to be certain that I'm not overstepping or taking advantage of him in any way. Am I just convincing myself that I have real feelings for him because it is the best possible outcome for the baby and me? Or is this real? The flutters in my belly feel real, but it's so sudden that I can't be certain. It could also be the first noticeable movements of our unborn child. If I'm totally honest with myself, 
considering the giant chicken and cheese burrito I had for dinner, it could also just be gas. I cringe a little at that unpleasant but accurate thought. Unable to fall asleep, I decide to watch some television. On a whim, I pull up my on-demand library and scroll through the movie selection. I find the one I want, and even while I'm whispering to myself that it's silly, I push the button to start it. I feel stupid at first and almost stop the movie, but before I know it, I am sucked into the magical story and am shocked that so much time has passed when the credits begin rolling. That wasn't nearly as bad as I expected, I say, to no one in particular while I'm paging through the menu in search of the second installment of the series. Excited to find it, I jump up to microwave a bag of buttery popcorn and take a quick bathroom break. Grabbing the hot popped corn bag and uncharacteristically not even bothering to pour it into a bowl, I hop back into bed, anxious to start the second flick. Losing myself in those stupid movies, I can barely believe that I'm bawling at the end of the half, Blood Prince. The first color beams of daybreak are already shining through the tiny gap between my curtains. Appalled that I stayed up all night to binge watch the majority of the Harry Potter movies, I get up to take a shower. Crumbs from the snack fest I partook in during the brief break between each movie fall from my pajamas as I stand. While in the shower, I briefly consider calling in sick to work so I can stay home and watch the final two movies in the series. The idea is incredibly tempting, despite the fact that I have never done anything like that in my life. I finally manage to convince myself not to gorge my newly discovered need any further. The main reason for my self-control is because I realize that once I tell Honey I have watched the first six movies, he will likely want to watch the last two with me. I am so anxious to share with Honey that I am now on board with the Potter series, which I have been mistakenly calling Juvenile for years. I can't wait to see his face, he is going to be beyond excited. I wonder if he'll want to watch the last two movies tonight. I need to sleep at some point, but I'm dying to know how everything works out. I bet he'll let me borrow his copies of the books, too. They are probably even better than the movies, as books usually are. I'm racing around my house as I get ready, even though I should have low energy from a lack of sleep. I will probably hit a wall later in the day, but right now I am just jazzed to see Honey and share this news with him. Maybe I should figure out a way to let him know, without directly telling him. I'll have to think on that one, on the way to work. Another bonus about having watched most of the movies, is that I am now privy to the peculiar lingo that only people familiar with Harry Potter understand. Sometimes when the guys slip into using those words, it feels like they are speaking a completely different language. Well no more boys. I speak it now too. On my short drive to work, I shake my head and marvel at how long it took me to come around and give the series a try. I should have taken Honey's word for it and given it a chance like Kai had, but I was simply too stubborn. Now I'm behind the curve on it, but I'm quickly catching up. Suddenly, a thought flashes into my mind that has me super excited. I'm pretty sure that Universal has a Harry Potter branded amusement park in California. I picture Honey, our little one, and me reading the books and watching the movies together in preparation for a family trip to check out that theme park. This will be something we can all three share our enjoyment in as a family. The idea thrills me. I cannot wait to tell Honey. I'm a little early for my shift, so I go straight to the restaurant, knowing that Honey will already be there serving breakfast. He's wearing his aquamarine uniform today, and the color suits him. The shirt features large hibiscus flowers, making it look like what tourists consider a traditional, gaudy Hawaiian shirt. He somehow makes it work though, and I pause to admire him before edging into the room. He smiles and heads in my direction as soon as he sees me. Once he's close enough I greet him before saying, I think we should start serving butterbeer here. He nods in agreement, before what I said fully sinks in, and he turns to give me a questioning look. In answer to his unasked question, I smile and add, that slimy Professor Snape is as evil as a slithering snake. He's not as bad as you think. Honey advises me. What? I screech at him, 
not caring that a few heads turn in our direction. He is a horrendous person, and nothing will ever change my opinion of that, I tell him firmly. What number are you on? Honey clearly thinks that my opinion of Snape might still be swayed. I just finished the sixth movie, and I hate Snape. Admittedly, I had done an about face on my opinion of Sirius Black mid series, but I just don't see how that could ever happen with Snape. Honey nods at my pronouncement. We'll see. He tells me cryptically, evidently opting not to spill any secrets about what in the world could make me change my feelings regarding that snake. We stand there in companionable silence for a while. Deciding to tease him a bit, I say, Why didn't you ever tell me how good they are? His face registers shock at first, but he quickly realizes I'm joking. What made you finally decide to give them a try? He asks me before blessing me with a huge grin. I have no idea, I answer him honestly. I guess I pictured you reading the books and watching the movies with Little Bit, and I didn't want to be left out. Little Bit? He asks smiling. I shrug my shoulders before nodding. I like it. His eyes are barely visible as his smile stretches nearly from one ear to the other. I ask him about borrowing his copies of the books, and he quickly agrees, telling me that the books are far more descriptive and magical than the movies. I had been trying to restrain myself, but before I know what I'm doing, I ask the burning question that had been bothering me all morning. Does it end okay? Before he can answer, I blurt, wait. Don't tell me. Half a second later, I say, don't give me any spoilers but it has a good ending, right? I'm afraid to hear his answer, but I don't want to wait until I'm able to watch the other two movies to see if Harry and his friends get a happy ending. Honey considers his answer carefully. I tap my foot impatiently. When he finally speaks, I wish that he hadn't. More people die, is his cryptic answer. Who? I can feel my eyes bulging, as if we are talking about real people. Wait, don't tell me. I change my mind. My thoughts are reeling through all of the possibilities. Who dies? I ask again. I'm completely torn between wanting to know and not wanting to ruin the surprise. The giddy anticipation feels remarkably like Christmas morning. Pony looks completely uncertain on how to respond. I'm sure he's wondering if I really want to know, or if it's better to make me wait. I make the decision for him. We have to watch the last two movies tonight after work, I inform him. Oh, um, tonight. Pony uncharacteristically stammers. With impeccable timing, Kalia sidles up behind Honey. Did Honey tell you I'm making him some of my famous homemade lasagna tonight for dinner? Her round face breaks into a friendly smile. She is clearly completely unaware of anything beyond friendship between Honey and me. I feel the color drain from my face, and the nausea that had stayed at bay throughout my Harry Potter marathon makes a quick reappearance. No, he didn't mention it, I finally croak. Honey's face is beet red, apparently all of the color I lost went to him. He looks uncertain what to say. This is obviously why he had hesitated about watching the last two movies with me tonight. He has a date. I've been picturing us going on family vacations together, and he has a date with a sweet and lovely woman. How stupid can I be? Seeming completely unaware of the bubbling tension, Kalia gently pats Honey's slightly protruding belly. You know, Leilani, they always say that the best way to a man's heart is through his tummy. I make a feeble attempt at a smile, mumble something about needing to get to work, and hightail it out of there. At least I make it outside before my churning stomach completely revolts. Envy though. I'm ashamed of myself. I want Honey to be happy. I truly do. It's just that I had started picturing him being happy with me and the baby. I hadn't envisioned him going out on dates, although I probably should have. When I see him nervously messing with his hands as he approaches the desk, I feel even worse. Honey is never anxious about anything. He is normally the epitome of the stereotypical, laid, back islander. I'm appalled that I've made him uncomfortable. 
He has bent over backwards to help me out of a tough situation, and I have somehow managed to make him feel guilty in the process. Hi. He gives me a sweet smile, but his Adam's apple bobs when he swallows, betraying his nervousness. He's silent for a while, but I'm at a loss for what to say, so I remain quiet. Finally, looking down, he says, I won't go out with Kalia, if it bothers you. I am aware that my reaction is important, so I frantically but silently summon any acting skills that four years of high school drama club bestowed on me, before answering. No puff. I'm not sure where that odd, disbelieving sound came from, but I try to go on like it was what I had intended. Why would it bother me? My voice is much too high, so I attempt to tone it down as I babble. I mean we were never a real couple, and even our fake relationship status is broken up, right? I know that I need to stop yammering, but I have one more thing on my mind. This part is the truth. Accordingly, my voice sounds much more sincere when I say, I just don't want me or the baby to get in the way of your happiness. You could never do that. He reaches over the desk to engulf my hand in his. His large hands feel warm and comfortable. His touch feels safe like home. I nod, not trusting myself to speak without crying. He squeezes my hand tenderly before releasing it. I immediately miss the connection with him. We're good. He asks me, tilting his head to check my reaction. I nod again and manage a smile this time. Rain check on the movies. He offers as he's walking away. After giving him my most convincingly cheerful finger wave, I burst into tears as soon as he is out of sight and earshot. I spend the rest of the day ruminating about what in the world is wrong with me, how could I be friends with Honey for all of this time and suddenly develop romantic feelings for him when he finds someone else? Is this just a rebound attraction, since I so recently lost a relationship that I had believed to be real? Am I taking advantage of Honey's kindness by allowing him to help raise the baby? Will I be able to handle seeing him with other women? What if he and Kalia get serious? I don't really care about him romantically, do I? Isn't it probably just a reaction to his willingness to be a father to my unborn child? Should I allow him to do that, or will I be limiting his future? That last one is my main concern. The selfish side of me wants Honey to be the baby's father. I know that is what would be best for my unborn child. Is that what is best for Honey, though? Or is he offering too much? I'm afraid the answers to those two burning questions are the reason my stomach feels so unsettled. This uneasiness is a different kind of queasy than my morning sickness. It's actually much worse because it feels bleak and unending. My distracted thoughts make me practically useless at work. I normally pride myself on being uber-professional and helpful at the front desk, but today, I managed to hang up on an overseas call, twice, give someone a key to a room that hadn't yet been cleaned, snap at a guest who asked me for the fourth time if we have an all-you-can-eat buffet, and trip over a child's princess suitcase in the entry. As a finale to that last one, I kept from falling down by catching myself on the bellhop's full trolley cart, which proceeded to roll over and spew luggage throughout the lobby. It might have been funny, had I not been in such a dreadful mood. The honked-off look I gave the concierge who snickered at the toppling luggage cart kept anyone else from chuckling at my mishap. Deciding that I am doing more harm than good, and thankful that it isn't a luau night, I opt to leave 15 minutes before my shift is over. There is plenty of coverage, and they don't need my sour attitude rubbing off on anyone. Driving home, I decide to take a bath to help ease some of my tension. Perhaps a soak and a sulk are exactly what I need. It can't hurt, and the relaxation in the tub might help me keep my mind off Honey and Kalia. Even as I'm thinking it, I know that it won't work. I haven't been able to think of anything else all day. As predicted, the bath doesn't work. I do, however, come up with an ingenious plan to distract myself by zoning out with the last two Harry Potter movies. While heating up my frozen cheese pizza, I try not to think about Kalia's homemade lasagna. If it's anything like her famous cherry cobbler, Honey's tummy will be in love. Is that really the way to a man's heart? 
I can make lasagna too. I snort at my errant thought. I have no idea where it came from, because I haven't ever even tried to make lasagna. Maybe this baby is messing with my brain. I suppose that I could make lasagna, if I had a recipe to follow. It probably wouldn't be as good as Kalia's though, I decide sadly. It's difficult to drum up much excitement for the movies, even though I was so anxious to see how it all turns out. With each scene I wonder what Honey thinks, or what he would say if he were here. I know that I need to stop torturing myself with these thoughts, but I can't seem to curb them. More than anything, I want to know if I am just being a jealous and ridiculous beast, or if I have true feelings for Honey. Honestly, I don't know which I hope for, because either way isn't likely to turn out great for me. Despite my grumpiness, I do get sucked into the movies. When the story takes an unexpected twist, and I do actually start to think Snape isn't completely evil, I say the words, darn it, aloud. I absently pat my tummy, as if some subconscious part of me is afraid the baby might have heard my harsh tone. Honey was right. I never would have believed my opinion could be swayed about that snake, but it has been, somewhat. I want to talk to Honey about it. I can't though because he's on a date, not with me. I try to shove that distressing thought out of my head, but it just won't go away. I want Honey to be with me. Making myself focus on the television screen, I finish watching the movies. When the last one ends, I click off the television and quickly fall asleep. For once, having stayed up all night binge watching something the night before pays off for me. I sleep like the dead and wake up feeling grouchy, hungry, mopey, and still tired. That's three or four of Snow White's dwarfs, I decide, smiling to myself and thinking that this parenting thing will be a piece of cake. Okay, probably not, but at least it made me smile. Smiley isn't a dwarf, right? Pushing Smiley, the dwarf or non dwarf, I'm not at all certain but don't have the energy to Google it to the forefront, I vow to not let my personal problems interfere with my work today. I'm filling in as the hostess at the restaurant, which is not ideal, because that is where Honey and Kalia are both working. At least Kalia will be busy back in the kitchen. I plan to put on my game face and not let anyone know the turmoil I'm feeling inside. The early morning rush is a breeze and I'm thinking that I have this shift under control until Kai's love interest, Roxy, arrives. I take her to what has already become her family's usual table. Her sister and grandmother must be sleeping in this morning because she is eating breakfast alone. When Honey takes Roxy her pot of tea, she asks him to sit down with her. This is a rather unconventional request, but I busy myself with seating the next guests. Despite trying to distract myself, I can't help but notice when she flirtatiously places her hand on his arm. When she bursts out in hysterical laughter over something Honey has said, I feel like walking straight over there and scratching her eyes out. My extra long pregnancy fingernails will help with that mission, I decide before becoming appalled by the gruesome twist my thoughts have taken. I can't seem to stop glaring at her back. What is it with this woman? As if having Kai completely enamored with her isn't enough. Now she has to go after Honey, too. I hate this jealous streak that has been rearing its ugly head within me, but I don't seem to be able to control it. Luckily, a young couple comes in to make dinner reservations, which draws my attention from Roxy hanging all over Honey. I do still notice when she gently pats his arm, and it makes me push way too hard on the pen as I write down the honeymooner's reservation in the book. The entry ends up looking like an angry child has written it. I'm still fuming, even after Honey has gotten up to take care of his other tables. I know that I have no right to be so angry, but it doesn't stop me. Perhaps I'm especially sensitive to this woman because she is a tourist, and I know that she is about ready to break Kai's heart. Maybe she is an easy target for my anger because I know what a sweet and wonderful person Kalia is, and I can't justify being mad at her for dating Honey. Whatever the case, Roxy is bringing out in me the worst dwarfs I've been yet, irritated, insecure, and hostile. They do not look good on me, but even though I know this, I can't seem to help it. When she leaves the restaurant, I follow her. I'm uncertain what I'll say when I catch up to her, 
but I feel compelled to have a chat with her. I tell myself it's for Kai's sake. When I get close enough, I speak to her back, making her pause mid-step. Is it not enough that you have Kai panting after you like a Great Dane in heat? Now you have to sink your claws into Honey too? Roxy turns, clearly angry and ready to let me have it, but something stops her. Her expression softens, and then she floors me by saying, Actually, Honey and I were talking about you. Really? I'm stunned by her revelation and embarrass myself by bursting into tears. I silently curse my spiking pregnancy hormones, even as Roxy puts a comforting arm around me. When she kindly asks if there is anything she can do to help, I tell her that she wouldn't understand. Proving that I'm right, she says, I understand that Honey is a kind, loving, gentle giant of a man, and that any woman would be lucky to have him. I nod in agreement through my tears before she adds, I also understand that you have won his heart. If only she could be right about that, but I am certain that I waited too long to let Honey know how I feel. He has moved on. I missed my shot with him, if I ever had one. When Roxy suggests that I go talk to him, I turn to head back to the restaurant. I don't have the heart to tell her it's too late. Besides, I've already cried enough for one work shift. I'll save the rest of my tears for when I get home. They will eventually shift in my favor. After all, not that long ago, I had been giddy with happiness and thinking I was in love with a man who turned out to be a total pig. It's amazing how much things have already changed since then. I walk for a while before plopping my butt down right in the sand, not worrying a bit about the gritty mess I'll have to deal with later. I've been sandy before, and I'm sure I will be again. Besides, getting to relax and enjoy the beach is well worth the extra hassle. Since I'm so distracted by the steady whirl of thoughts running through my brain, I don't hear Baggy walk up behind me. Surprisingly, she does not have her finger gun at the ready. In fact, she seems almost normal as she sits down right beside me and asks if I am okay. I nod in answer, but when she kindly starts rubbing my back, the dam bursts on my I'm just fine facade. No, I'm not okay, I blurt. I'm pregnant by a man who abandoned me. I'm totally jealous of one of the sweetest women I've ever known because she went on a date with Honey. I'm utterly confused about my feelings for Honey. I'm growing to hate myself for my uncharacteristic indecision and selfishness, and I'm starting to get cankles. The last word is drawn out as I finally let the tears that have been building begin to flow. I lift my foot as evidence that the lower portion of my leg looks remarkably similar to a log because it no longer has any taper. Baggy shakes her head. Ugh. Cankles are the worst. In hindsight, I realize that I should have anticipated this type of reaction from her. I spill my heart out to her, and she chooses to focus on the least important part of my admission. It's nothing less than I would have expected from the batty old woman, had I paused to think this through. I'm afraid you're stuck with them until after the baby is born, though. She's still rubbing my back, and it feels divine. The gentle back-and-forth motion is soothing, and it is the only reason why I don't devise an excuse and make a quick getaway. We're quiet for a bit, both of us staring out to sea, lost in our own thoughts. It surprises me when Baggy casually says, I can fix all of that other stuff for you though. I'm almost scared to hear what she has to say. Considering the wild antics she is known for pulling, She's liable to offer to make Kalia swim with the fishes to put me out of my misery. Deciding that I will probably be implicated in whatever harebrained scheme she is plotting, I ask her how she can fix it. Oh, that's easy, she tells me. You need to go find that huge and hunky beefcake, Honey. I roll my eyes at her description, but let her continue without interruption. Once you find him, sit him down in a chair and do a saucy little striptease for him. She leans closer then, as if telling me a great secret. No man can resist a pregnant, voluptuous woman, especially when she's undressing for him. I'm shaking my head, but she keeps right on talking. Here's a free tip. She tells me seriously. Dangle your clothes from your fingertips, then toss them at his face. He'll love it. She hoots with laughter as she shares her plan. I don't think, 
I start but she continues talking as if I haven't uttered a word. The rest is simple. Once you are totally redacted, redacted until he forgets any other woman exists. She gives me a proud smile then, like she believes that she has just solved all of my problems. That isn't the answer, I tell her firmly. Ask any man, she responds. It doesn't even matter what the question is, a man will tell you that is always the answer. That is what got me into this mess in the first place, I remind her, placing my hand on my somewhat swollen belly. You aren't in a mess, dear, she informs me, and I wonder if she has even been listening to me at all. I've seen the way Honey looks at you, and I've seen the way you look back at him. She stops rubbing my back and turns to look at me. You two are in love with each other. We're just really great friends. I shake my head, letting her know she is misunderstood. We always have been. If you two are just friends, then I'm an 80-year-old virgin. She cackles with laughter at her own slapstick, elbowing me sharply in the side when I don't join her. She looks down at her lap and sticks her lower lip out as she talks. This poor, wrinkly old redacted has never known a man. Having no desire to talk about or even think about this woman's lady parts, I make a move to get up. She takes a hold of my arm to stop me. Suddenly serious, she says, I may be a crazy old broad, but I know when two people should be together, and you two belong with each other. With that, she lets go of my arm. I bid her good night and scurry quickly away. Is she right? Do I belong with Honey? Or is she just a loony old bat? Deciding that she's definitely a nut, I wonder if I can believe any of what she said. My brain tells me that I should not trust her instincts, but my heart desperately wants her to be right. There's only one way to find out, I guess. Tonight, I'll talk to Honey. He likes me in that way. Things were so much simpler in adolescence. During my short commute home, I arrive at the realization that my true reluctance to find Kai most likely had to do with the fear that he would convince me that a romance between Honey and me would be an enormous mistake. It would risk ruining our friendship, as well as our plan to raise the baby as a team. If I spill my guts about my newly awakened feelings to Honey and he doesn't reciprocate, awkwardness will reign whenever the two of us are together. I can't stop thinking about Kalia either. She's perky, pretty and perfect for Honey. What if they really hit it off on their date? I'm not at all sure that I can stand to be around the two of them, giving each other googly eyes, and act like nothing is amiss. What would a serious relationship between the two of them mean for the baby? Will Kalia become the baby's stepmom if they end up getting married? I'm extremely concerned about what will happen with Little Bit if Honey has children of his own someday. Will he regret his promise to be a father to my child? I would rather my baby not have a father at all than to have one and lose him, or to be treated like a nuisance. That would be unbearably sad. Determining that honesty is the best policy, I decide to share my jumbled thoughts and feelings with Honey. He deserves to know what is going on in my mind and heart, and I need to know how he feels, even if it's bad news. Before I can chicken out, I shoot him a text. Please stop by my house when you get off work. He responds immediately with the dreaded and oversimplified. K. And I flop down on my bed, wondering if I'm about to make the biggest mistake of my life. Feeling exceptionally nervous, I get up and pace my small bedroom while waiting for Honey to arrive. Numerous times, I imagine the possible outcomes of this confrontation I am forcing upon us. The vast majority of them end with me broken-hearted and raising little bit on my own. There is really only one scenario that ends well. Scratch that, it would end divinely but only if Honey is interested in me too. The more likely end result is an overwhelming uneasiness that leaves the two of us unwilling to share the same space for the foreseeable future. Imaginary Kai was probably right when I pictured him telling me that I would end up messing up a relationship that I cherish by moving into the unchartered territory of romance. It takes Honey longer than I would have thought to get here. By the time his knock at the door startles me, 
I am certain I have paste ruts into my carpet. I have been unsuccessfully trying to stop the mental images of him having to break a date with Kalia to respond to my texted request to come over. Surely he wouldn't do that. Would he? When I fling open the door, he beams at me, obviously unaware that I might be about to ruin our easy camaraderie. He lifts both arms proudly, making me realize what took him so long to get here. One hand holds the last two Harry Potter movies. The other holds a sleeve of microwavable popcorn and my favorite brand of caffeine-free root beer. I grin back at him, touched that he thought to grab pregnancy-appropriate snacks. I already watched them, I inform him, pointing at the DVDs his giant hands are clutching. I couldn't wait. His eyes sparkle at this news. What did you think? He asks, sounding like an overexcited schoolboy. I love them just like you knew I would, I admit, looking down and shaking my head. Having geared myself up to receive a giant, I told you so, I was pleasantly surprised when Honey merely wants my opinions. We sit down on my couch as he proceeds to ask me which movie was my favorite, which was my least favorite, if my opinion of Snape had been swayed, what I thought of the music and costumes, and so on. He mentions that Hermione has always reminded him of me, which I find flattering since she is incredibly smart and a hero in her own right. I had already suspected he relates to the dynamic of the three main characters since it centers around three friends, two boys and a girl. The books are even better than the movies. He informs me. They have so much more detail in them. You have to read them. He adds excitedly. Okay, I smile at him. Do you know anyone who has them for me to borrow? I tease. He lights up. You can borrow my copies. I'll go get them. He offers. He's already moving to stand when I say, I don't need them right this second. I pause for a bit, uncertain how to transition the conversation to where I want it to go. Opting to indirectly mention the elephant in the room, I try to keep the shakiness out of my voice as I ask him, so, how was Kalia's lasagna? It was delicious. He responds without offering anything further. Are you two going out again? The smile I have plastered on my face feels brittle and fake. I hope it doesn't look as horrid as it feels. He answers so quietly that I barely hear him. I don't think so. He's looking down, so he can't see that my heart is about ready to beat out of my chest. I wonder if he can hear it. The loud pounding is echoing throughout my head. She's cute and sweet and a phenomenal cook. I'm glad he is still looking down as he's speaking because I wouldn't want him to see the spurt of jealousy flaring in my eyes before I can cover it. Everything he has said about her is absolutely true, and I don't have any right to be envious, but these facts don't negate my bitter feelings. She's also kind. He adds before looking up at me. Really kind. I nod because I know this to be accurate as well. It doesn't make it an easier pill to swallow, though. I hate the negative emotions I am feeling, but I don't seem to be able to control them. It doesn't feel like me, but I guess it must be. I don't want to be a hateful, envious person. I hated to hurt her, but I didn't know what else to do. He says sadly, looking back down now. My head is still nodding because his words haven't yet sunk in. Wait, hurt her? I ask when what he has said finally dawns on me. He isn't looking at me, so I have a hard time reading his expression as he speaks. I didn't want to string her along, because it seems like she really cares about me. I struggle with myself to remain neutral. Honey is coming to me as a trusted confidant. I'm certain it would be wrong to tell him he did the right thing by letting Kalia down. I would only be saying that for selfish reasons. I need to find out the whole story, but he doesn't seem to be dying to spill it. Deciding to tread lightly and reaching out to lift his chin, I ask, would you like some herbal tea? He nods, giving me a sad smile before following me to my tiny kitchen. He seems to fill up the entire space, and I like having him in such close quarters. When he reaches around me to pull mugs from the cabinet, his nearness makes my heart skip a beat. Attempting to distract myself from our close proximity, 
I busy myself with heating the teapot and finding the tea accoutrements. Once the mango green tea is steeping, I turn to him and catch a whiff of his scent. It's piney and masculine, with a hint of coconut. I want to close my eyes and breathe it in, but I manage to stop myself from going that far. Let's chat in the living room where it's more comfortable, I suggest. My ulterior motive being that, on the couch, I won't be as tempted to sidle up to him and see what the warmth of his front feels like against mine. Curling my legs up underneath me on the sofa, I wrap my hands around the heated tea mug. The action itself is comforting, and it keeps my hands too busy to reach out to Honey. Kalia seems like she is perfect for you. I force myself to voice my fear. I know. He answers, and I try not to let the disappointment show on my face. He's quiet for a bit, then he adds. My brain knows that she would be ideal for me, but my heart belongs to another. It always has. He admits, sounding sad. My heart is beating double time as I try to tamp down the hope that is springing up in my chest. Is he talking about me? What if he is? What if he isn't? He takes a sip of his tea before setting down his mug and turning to me. I've had feelings for the wrong person for almost my entire life. He admits. Why the wrong person? I ask, almost scared to hear the answer. Seeming like he is ignoring my question, Honey starts in. She's beautiful, kind, funny, giving, sweet, talented, smart, and darn near perfect. What would she ever see in someone like me? Well, if she's so smart, she should see that you are all of those things as well, I tell him honestly. We've been the best of friends our whole lives, and I don't want to risk messing that up. He turns to look at me then, and most of the doubts I am having about whether he is talking about me melt away in the warmth of his chocolate-hued eyes. I'll take whatever you can give me, Lonnie. He rushes on before I have a chance to speak. I know that I'm not the man of your dreams, but I'll do everything in my power to make you and our baby happy. Maybe someday you'll be able to grow to love me. The mixture of humility, fear, and pain in his voice breaks my heart. Pony, you don't need to settle, I tell him firmly. You are a remarkable human being and you deserve to be with someone who appreciates you for who you are, someone who loves you for you. He nods even as he says, Tell my stupid heart that. It has been pining away for someone who is completely out of my league for over a decade. Deciding to go all in, I say, You're in love with me? I'm 99% sure that he is, but I need to be positive. He is looking down at the carpet, but I can still see that his face turns so red it's almost purple as he nods quickly in affirmation of my question. Leaning close, I take his hand in mine and whisper near his ear. All of these years, I've been searching for the perfect man, and he has been right in front of me all along. I've been blind, but now I see. I press my lips to his burning cheek. When he turns to face me, I can see the welling tears glistening in his eyes. You feel sorry for me. It's part question, part accusation, but before I can respond he adds, You should be with someone handsome like Kai, or successful like Tom. First off, you are handsome and successful, I remind him. Secondly, I should be with who I want to be with, and that someone is you. I can tell that he wants to believe me, but his ingrained fears and inferiority complex won't allow it. Delving deeper, I say, I made an enormous mistake with Tom. I was looking for all of the wrong things when I was with him, shallow things. When I think about what is truly important, like who the first person I think of in the morning, or who the last person on my mind at night is, who I want to share big news with, who I feel like I can truly be myself with, who I can laugh and cry with, and who I want to raise my child with, it's all you, Honey. His eyes are sparkling, and I can tell that he is opening himself up to believing what I am saying. Nudging him gently with my elbow, I say, You are the Ron to my Hermione. This pronouncement makes him break into one of his signature beaming smiles. Lifting our joined hands, I place my palm over his on my belly. This isn't how I would have thought things would work out, but I'm certain it's exactly how they are meant to be. I'm pretty sure I'm the happiest man on earth, and I know I'm the luckiest. He gushes, making me feel all warm and melty inside. I feel overwhelmed with emotion, 
both deep friendship and a simmering love that I hadn't realized had been there. Our Kiki is so blessed to have you for a father, I tell him warmly. And you for a mother, he reminds me. The happiness is bubbling around us like the frothing sea. We might not have all of the answers right now, and this may not be exactly how we pictured our future, but it feels right. I lean towards my best friend, the father of my child and the love of my life. Shall we seal it with a kiss? I ask him. He answers me by tenderly touching his lips to mine. I'm thrilled to discover that I feel his sweet kiss all the way to the tips of my toes. If I had been harboring any lingering doubts about if this was the right decision for us, his lips erase them. My worries dissipate as my mind goes blank and the sparks fly. Continue your fun by listening to the other books in the Escape series, Getting Laid, Cruising for Love, Island Hopping, and the bonus short story, Coco, Nutty Christmas.